All right, obviously it's um, about a minute a minute before start time. Um, I'll wait for just a little bit longer and then we'll get started. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for showing up again, those who were here last week. And uh, thank you for showing up for the first time, if it's your first time. Um, so this week, we're going to be talking about the Report Center. And there are a couple of things that I'm definitely not going to be going over, at least today. Uh, maybe not ever, because there are probably better resources. Um, one of the things that I'm really not going to try to go over is going to be SQL queries. Um, in general, there are way better resources out there to teach you how to build an SQL query than me. Uh, truth be told, I can fumble my way through it and usually make it, um, make it through to where I need, but it would be an embarrassing waste of time if I tried to teach anybody here. So that's um, something we're going to skip. However, if you do have a specific SQL related question, um, message me on the forums and I will definitely help if I can. So um, another topic that is something I want to eventually go into some because I think this is an important aspect of the Report Center is VBScript. So you can run a script after you run a report and basically just just do stuff with the data. Um, it's it's really broad what you can do. You can export and uh, export your data and drive it to an ERP solution, um, or even pull it out of Cabin Division, manipulate it a little bit, and stuff it back in. But again, it's too complicated for me to try to teach, and I'm still learning myself. So. I, um, I'm going to skip that as well. And the last thing that I'm definitely not going to cover today is going to be collection and some variables. Um, I, again, I can work my way through this, but I don't know it well enough to teach it or even try to explain it. So we'll skip that for now. So without further ado, um, I would say that reporting and cabin division can be broken down into two main parts. And the first of those parts is going to be um, the report properties, which is where we build our SQL queries, which is what I was saying we're not really going to go into. So um, I will jump into this for just a second, though. So report properties. Basically, this is where you're going to build your basic SQL queries in general. And then... Um, There's a lot of different things that you can do with this, but that's going to be probably a different session than this one. So anyhow, this would be where we get the data. This is how we get what we want to see. And we also control a little bit of how we want to see it here. Um, that's probably pretty basic. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with that, but I did want to kind of, kind of show that for a second. And then the second part of reports, which is what I'm going to try to focus a lot more on today is the design editor. Um, the design editor, I would say, is really, it's going to control how you display your information. And best practice would be to get everything as well formatted and everything as you can with the report properties and a good quality query before you bring it into the design. However, um, I have overcome query challenges by jumping through some hoops in the design editor. So I don't think that's the best way to handle it. But if you are not quite able to build the query you desire to get the information you want, sometimes you can manage to make it happen within the design editor itself. So um and then the, the last thing I want to kind of like just briefly touch on is that um, 
This piece of software here that we're looking at, this is technically Cabinavision, but it's called Combit List and Label, and it's a little bit of a bolt-on software for reporting. Um, it's used worldwide by a lot of different big organizations to do exactly what we do with Cabinavision, but um, Cabinavision has limited some of the options that we have in here, which can be frustrating. And so one of the things that I really wanted to point out here, first of all, um, if you press F1 while you're in the design editor, you're going to get two help files popping up. One of them is Cabinavision, and you can just close that. And the other one is going to be the Combat List and Label Designer help file. This is fairly helpful, fairly useful. And in terms of like accuracy, and what I mean by that is um, if you were to download Combat List and Label today, the the version you get is label 28 and as you can see here on my screen we're looking at label 21 so there's going to be discrepancies there however if you were to download combat list and label you're going to get some extras that go along with it and the extras are really the only way that you can actually use this tutorial um, or build these examples if you are not working with combat itself with the extra database information that they include with it, you're never going to make it through these um, through these exercises. So, if you haven't seen already, um, I created a somewhat detailed post on the Cabin Division forums, and I would really go through and and read it. It's fairly lengthy. I apologize. It's kind of what I do. Um, I tend to build walls of text, but there's really good information in there. And if you can take the time to just slowly, steadily work your way through it, you're going to you're gonna really benefit. You will spend so much more time fumbling through this if you don't try to utilize those resources than it will take you to read through them and then start to work on this. Um, and last but not least, I learned about this maybe yesterday. Sandy McClintock from Cabinet Vision has put together this 99-page PDF, and it's probably been out for, I don't know, since version 9, which at this point is, it's, it's really, it's probably more than five years old. But it is another really, really good quality document that is going to... I think it's going to help connect the dots for a lot of you. And she also does a really spectacular job of kind of doing a little bit of a demo of a different piece of software called FlySpeed. And FlySpeed is something that I've known that I should get, but I haven't really gotten until just recently. And I have been kind of tinkering with it a little bit and what i will say is that i think fly speed is going to be exactly what i need to overcome my shortcomings relating to sql queries it's it's got a bunch of buttons it's a big interface and i'm sure it's an extraordinarily powerful piece of software that i don't even i can't even really scratch the surface of right now but the little bit i do know about it actually makes the joining of tables, which is one of the most challenging aspects of SQL queries for me, um, it makes the joining of the tables very easy. It almost kind of automatically does it. And if I'm not mistaken, if it's impossible to join a table, Flyspeed basically will tell you as much. Um, so it's a good piece of software based on what I've learned so far, and I highly recommend you take some time to go through and learn it. It will help you out tremendously with your queries, if I'm not mistaken. So um, now that I've kind of gone through that sort of thing, um, let's talk about, there's a couple of different points I want to touch on specifically. So. Um, the first thing that I will go over is user variables. So user variables. Um, again, reading through the help file is probably the best way for you to understand, or even with with um, reading through Sandy's little tutorial is probably the best way to understand what a user variable does. But ultimately, um, the way I like to use it 
is if I want to report something just one time on a report, and a really great example would be um, job information, right? There's only one job name. We don't need to report a table of job names. So you can use a, a user variable to pull just that one piece of information and drive it somewhere on your report. So there's a, a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this. And so I've built this kind of basic report here and I've got two tables. And on this top table, I've got some room information, um, just a room name, room description, room number, and then I have a room note in my job file, machine for polls. And this could just, I mean, this could be anything, right? Maybe maybe you're shipping out to some other company and they don't want you to machine for the polls or I, I don't know, it's just an example. But if I don't know how to build the proper query to join my rooms and my notes, and I try to work around it by just using a user variable to pull my room note and inject it into this table, which is what I've kind of done here. I've got a at machine for pulls note. Um, and again, this is my, uh, sorry, user variable. So if my note, if, if, um, if I have marked this as true, which is the same as one, then I would like for this column, machine for polls, to display yes. Otherwise, display no. That's really all this says. It's pretty simple. So this is great, right? It's it's showing up, yes. I'll show you my, um, my room one properties just so we can... And we're crashing, I think. Yep, there it goes. All right. Just a second. All right, so here's my machine for pulls note, and it's true. So if we go and we look at this next room, machine for pulls is false. And so I've kind of said it true, false, true, false throughout these. And so, again, I'm just trying to demonstrate how you can use a user variable to pull the first record of a table, the information that will show up on the very first record of a table. You can do that reliably. It can be valuable, but it can also be a total failure. So this is the table that I've built. And the top one here as you can see, I've got all of my rooms, but once the user variable hit the first record where machine for pulls says yes, it doesn't look to the next record in the table. It's just yes, 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 all the way down. It doesn't actually care. So um, the reason I'm sharing this is I did try to use this one time to get around something. And it was very frustrating for me because working in the designer, you really only see one record. And so I, I put a good amount of work in and, it seemed on the surface like, oh yeah, this is great. I've got this working. And the reality is that I very much did not. So instead, if you're trying to report several records that could have different bits of information, you have to use a table to reliably do this. So is there value in the user variables? I absolutely believe that there is. And one of these other reports here is where I'm going to show you specifically how I've used it to overcome some of the challenges I've faced with um, limited features with Combit. So let's see here. I kind of. All right, so to, to give the best example I can of where I would use a user variable in a report specifically, because this is essentially an example of where I would not. We buy our drawer boxes from another company. We don't make them ourselves. So here's their order form. And because I'm trying to conform to their specific order form, rather than just producing a report and sending it to them, I ran into this problem. 
in Combit, you can only have one report container. And so what that essentially amounts to is it becomes very difficult to have a table of information report on half of your paper and then also use the same information driven from the same table to populate information beside the table. Um, and so I'm going to jump into the design of this real quick to try to make a little more sense of that. So I have a table for my drawers and I have a table for my rollouts. And what's going to happen is, depending on how many drawers and rollouts I have, this list will populate and expand down. But what about the material, right? If I'm trying to report what material these drawer boxes and rollout trays are, how do I get it to only show up one time? without, you know, basically if I tried to incorporate white melamine into this table, it would repeat white melamine on every single line. And their order form doesn't show this. So it's kind of it's kind of a challenge that I had to overcome. And because you cannot insert more than one report container, say I wanted to, you know, reduce the width of this and then stick another table in over here to the left of it, that is not possible with the version of Combit that we are allowed to use. So again, to kind of get past that, and I'm not going to save this because my layout's all screwed up at this point, but to get past that, I've put a simple text box and it is going to pull a user variable that I've created at drawer materials. And so what is that user variable? Depending, we we sell, what is this, six different, um, we use six different colors, if you will, or materials in the drawer boxes that we offer. So I don't want to, this is a fairly simple set of if statements, but basically if the material schedule is this, call out white melamine. If it's that, black melamine, blah, blah, blah. And so you might be thinking, well, what if you have more than one color? Aren't we going to run into the exact same problem that you just talked about, where it's going to hit the first record of white melamine and then just print that over and over? Well, yes, that would be the case. However, because of the way that this company builds their order forms and their requirements, I cannot order more than one material on one order form. So it's one order per material. And this was the best way that I found to get around that challenge of not being able to put tables side by side. So could it be done another way? Absolutely. It very much could. However, this was the fastest, easiest, simplest way for me to get white melamine or black melamine or whatever to show up where I needed it to. So again, it's just, I'm just checking to see do I have any drawers? So what this basically says is if my drawer materials user parameter is blank, which is what these two quotes amounts to, um, then put the rollout materials. Otherwise, put the drawer materials. And what this eventually resolves to is I, if I don't have drawers or rollouts, it doesn't do either, which is what I want. So I have some conditional things going on down here. Um, Sometimes we order side mounts, sometimes we order under mounts. And so you can, right, this company asks us, do we want to notch for under mount slides? And yeah, we do. If we're buying under mounts, we definitely do. So I'm using another user variable here, at drawer type, and it just puts an X. So if we go back and look at my user variables again and find at drawer type. So essentially, this is a little bit challenging for me to explain, but I'm just checking here. And the one, I'll show you what this means. So I'm checking for a one and I'm, I'm ultimately checking to see if the first character of the drawer or rollout schedule is one. And if it is one, hey, absolutely. You're, you're very welcome. 
I'm happy to have you come come by. Um, so so to get back to this, right? Let me show you my schedules, just so this makes a little more sense. So what I'm essentially trying to do here, I have my draw boxes labeled one and two. So that my undermount draw boxes are one and my side mount draw boxes are two. So if the first character within my draw box schedule happens to be one, then my report knows, as long as I've set everything else up correctly, that I want undermount draw boxes. So what it does in response to that is it puts X's in the correct fields and leaves the incorrect fields blank. So I don't need notches. I don't need clips if I have side mount guides. However, obviously I do if I have under mount guides. So I really just wanted to kind of explain that's how I use user variables by and large. There are a lot of other ways that you can use them. You can modify the margins or the report container size with user variables without having to actually get into the report designer, which can be valuable as well. I don't really build mine that way, um, which is probably, I don't know, good, bad, right, wrong, or other. Um, I don't, but you can. So anyhow, um, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is, um, you probably saw this. Sometimes when you're running a report, there's critical information that you do not want to forget to enter. Or honestly, from time to time, um, not from time to time, honestly, to build a robust, flexible report that can work for several different users without having to define static values like, um, Every single computer has a user, like a like a a user information field where they could type their name in there, and you could pull from that if you wanted to. But then, if I go to my colleague's computer and I sit down and I work on it because I don't know for whatever reason, when I generate their reports, I'm now creating a report that has their information on it, despite the fact that I am absolutely the person that did the work. So, what I like to do to combat that. What I like to do to make it so that I can create one report and send it out to everybody on the team without having to get on their computers and tell them, you need to fill out this field with this because this is your name and this is how it gets onto the reports. I prefer to build um, like user prompts or pop-ups. So again, kind of going into this drawer order form, as soon as I click it and we start generating the report, requested due date, right? When do I want these draw boxes? Well, say I know that my job is going to be starting on the 20th and I want to have the boxes here a week ahead of schedule so we can make sure they're right. You know, I can just 12-13 or whatever date, right? And then enter your email address. And all of our employees have at absoluteclosets.com email addresses. So I've populated this to have that by default. And when this comes up, you can just press home and type your name in, right? So once you've entered those three pieces of information, it's going to populate it. So on this order form, our vendor likes to know who the contact is and what their email address is. So because I created that pop-up, I was able to just type my name and type you know, the prefix to my email address, and it populates it automatically. Um, requested due date down here, right? There's a little field where these guys allow us to say, I want this on this date. And so because I was able to type that date in there, it populates the report automatically. So um, creating pop-ups within your reports is an extraordinarily powerful tool. Another place that I use this in is my S2M Center reports. We have a material, it's a melamine, it's a textured melamine product by a company, Stevenswood. Some of you are probably familiar with it, but they've got two finishes on their standard product line. It's um, like Artica or Rain. So they offer pearl white with an Artica finish or a Rain finish. They offer dark noche with an Artica finish or a Rain finish. So when we're producing, rather than me doing double duty and entering all of these materials into our software twice, because that sucks for upkeep, 
in general, and it makes you have way more material schedules to deal with than you need, I chose to only enter it into our software one time because fortunately our pricing on those two products is identical. But if anybody on our team does process a job with one of those products, when they go to the S2M Center, before they print their material summary, they get a pop-up and it asks them, what is the finish for your material? And they've got a drop down. They can select Rain or Artica. I feel like this is an extraordinarily um, powerful way to build checkpoints into your process to help you ensure that um or at least reduce mistakes right nobody's perfect there's always going to be mistakes but this will really help you reduce the volume of them dramatically so um how do we do that i'm going to release a little more information after the stream for the specifics of it but it's fairly simple it's the ask string function so it's really just as simple as that. It is a built-in feature of the software. You can um, search function up here. And if you type for ask string, here you, here you have your, your options for this, right? So ask string choices allows you to only select from available choices. However, ask string allows you as the user to type what you want. So. Where would I use each of these? You already saw me use ask string in this report. What I described about the S2M center and the different finish types for our melamine would be where I would use ask string choice. So that I define my two possible choices. So one of the guys on the team cannot just, you know, they can't typo it. They can't do anything wrong unless they're just literally just turning their brains off and not paying any attention they're going to stand a much better chance of driving the correct information to our shop so that we process the right materials. So this is a really powerful feature in the software. Um, if anybody would like to learn more specifically about it or how they might be able to use it in one of their reports they're using, just send me a message um, after the stream and I'll try to work with you on it. I don't, I just don't want to spend too much more time on this. So. The next thing that I really wanted to show that I personally find to be very valuable. Well, we'll, we'll go to one other um, one other outside vendor report that we use because we also we also order doors um, from another company. So thermofoil doors, we don't have the capacity to fabricate those ourselves. So obviously, it's an order out product, right? So what I've done here is, again, I've taken some of their order form, the way they like to see it, and I've built a report around that idea. So I'm not going to go into this one too much. I could probably spend 20 or 30 minutes just talking about this report. I really, really like this report for a lot of reasons. Um, it does a lot of really, really cool things. Uh, driving the foil number, driving the material type. Um, driving the the our vendors internal part names you know like lu is left unfinished end for cabin vision well this company uses rnpd for their rain airplane drawer fronts for example and with this company this is another little feature i wanted to show you which is really why i even came to this report they do not have matching melamine backers for every single foil color they've got. Imagine that, right? There's probably a thousand or more foil colors. And so, of course, they're not going to have a matching melamine backer for each of them. So by default, when my team runs this report, our backer comes up with the code MB for matching backer. That's their internal code. But if you click the drop down, you have a choice. You can go with white, black, raw, or you can actually type other or you can type, you know, a number because they have numbers that reference their melamine backers. So we've built a report here that can can pull all of the necessary information that Cabinet Vision could possibly provide. 
And we've also allowed it the flexibility for us to modify it in the ways that we need to get this done. Um, I have, just so you guys are kind of, to, to, to drive the point home, I have one material schedule for this product, but we can order, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 different door styles and a variety of different doors because of how I've built this report. So I might do a, a session just on this report because, again, I really, really like what I've done with this one. And I can't even begin to share it without going pretty deep into it. But this is a really neat feature, just the ability to change this to whatever you want to get what you need for your specific situation is very, very powerful. So last but not least, um, we're at 30 minutes, so I'm going to kind of cruise through this next little part. Um, we, because we buy our drawer boxes out and sometimes buy our doors and drawer fronts, but obviously other times do not, um, when we have a lock on a drawer, it's challenging for our shop to know where to mill the drawer front um, in relation to the lock hole that we have already milled on slab faces. So in other words, if I've got a melamine slab front that needs a lock, but I'm buying a dovetail drawer box, I still want to mill for my lock on my drawer front because I want it to be exactly where, you know, the architect has told me it needs to be or the homeowner has said they want it. I don't want to leave that up to the shop. I don't want to give them the option to kind of make a mistake with this. So how do you make that happen without the ability to also mill your drawer box subfront at the same time, which is really what is so cool about the ability to apply um, I think we're calling them at this point primary and secondary operations that match one another. Wherever your lock hole for your face goes, your um, your mating machinery or your mating milling on your subfront will always align with it. That's a really cool thing. So I've got just a couple of different drawers here, and they're all different sizes, right? So what that means is these locks. The lock body gets milled into our subfront here, represented by this sort of blue rectangle. And then the, the fuchsia lines here are the hole that we put in the face, right? So you've got a lock and the lock just kind of resides after you put everything together. It's completely hidden and there's just a slot that comes up. It's a really sweet lock. But again, how do we get the shop, our shop guys, to actually mill this subfront exactly where we are expecting it when it's not on their CNC. So what I have done is I built an image. It's just a super simple static image, right? There's nothing special about it. I kind of drew this in CAD. Um, and what I have is a representation of where our lock will go on the drawer front and a measurement from the outside of the box to the center of where I need this to be milled at. It's a very easy measurement for our shop guys to, to take or to measure, right? So if this was six inches from the outside of the box, they take their template that they've built, their jig, they measure six inches over, they mill it, and we're golden. So how do I get a dynamic number to show up with a static image on my report. Because that is exactly what we have here. So I just clicked on my drill lock location report. I've got different numbers from the outside of my drawer box to the center of my milling for each one of these drawer boxes. And each one of these is a different value. It doesn't look that great here, but I can tell you for sure that when we print this, it actually looks really good. So this was 
this was my solution for getting this information out to our shop without everybody having to every single time build something or write a piece of paper or trans, you know, transpose numbers. So how do we do this? It's a combination of a couple of things, but specifically, so we have our number five and seven sixteenths. If we jump into the table, it's this line right here. So, you know, I've got a lock offset from right value that I think I've driven through notes to, to pull into the report. We're not going to talk about how I got it here, but I have a number, right, that I got from the software based on where I put my lock. And I've used some fractional rounding stuff to take a decimal value and um, force it to be sixteenths of an inch precision because obviously it's you know fairly easy to read a sixteenth of an inch on a tape and so this is this is the way I've done it but if I had not written that just five point four two three two is a pretty challenging number to measure on a tape. So again um, We've taken that number and we've gotten it to display as a fractional value that's very easy to measure on a tape and it's within the tolerance of how this this works for us right so then i also have a pdf that i showed you that is embedded into this report so as we do database updates i don't have to send an image out every time it's just built in right so this row is my PDF and I can't even click on this number in here so in order to get this number to, to sort of drop down and locate itself right in between my dimension lines so that no matter what and by the way if the locks on the left hand side you still get the same image but it still gives you a number so as long as you're measuring you're still good right so how do we, I'm glad you guys like it. Um, I like this one a lot too. So the way that we get this number to drop down and land in this location every single time has to do with right here. Let me expand this a little so it's a little bit easier to see. So this frame section of the line itself is gonna control how much spacing you have to the left, to the top, to the right, and to the bottom of your number. So what I've done here is I've actually entered a negative value. And because this entire sort of block of information, we'll call it, always reports one at a time, it's like it's almost like this is, um, well, they're grouped, I guess, is the best way that I could say it. But anyway, Normally, you don't want to set a number like this to drive your value away from its standard location, but in this particular case, it worked out perfectly. So I'm just going to um, default this to zero so you can see where it is actually supposed to be. And then that will hopefully kind of... Right, so now it's actually all the way down here, which, which makes a lot of sense, if you understand what we're looking at here. If line two is my PDF, line three is gonna come after line two every single time, which is this row here that we're kind of seeing, the five and seven sixteenths, right? So setting my top spacing to that negative value, instead of giving me a top clearance and pushing it down, it actually pulls it up right into position. And since this static image never changes, it works. So this is just scratching the surface of how cool the ability to add static images actually is. This is a this is a really neat feature of the report editor in general, and I really really like the the flexibility of it. It's extraordinary. It's it's actually really cool, and it's very complicated as we are all aware, but it's a really neat part of the software. So um, I think that this is more or less it for what I wanted to cover. I kind of just check my notes real quick.
yeah, so so that was it for the planned content. Um, if anybody has any questions or would like to see more of anything, I will gladly um, go a little more in depth into anything. So. How long does it take you to learn the basics of combat? Well, I think that depends a lot on what your definition of basics is. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. It's taken me a long time. I have fumbled through this for quite some time. Once I really sat down and started actually working with it, I feel like. I feel like the first report I produced that I actually was really, really happy with was probably two or three weeks in of just just trying, you know, just trying different things. And and that that's starting from, yeah, I know that there's some there's a language called SQL and it does something with databases, but I don't know how to apply it. You know, that's kind of where I started. So I didn't know SQL. And obviously, I didn't know Combit. So, um, yeah, it took me probably two weeks pretty steady of just trying to get what I was after. But I don't think it will take, I genuinely believe, if you utilize the resources available. And I wish that, I don't know, maybe I had been able to do a better search on the forums. For some reason, I missed a lot of the really important stuff. You know, Matt Jones had posted that PDF I talked about from Sandy at least a half dozen times. And once once I saw it and I knew what to search for, it came up all over the place. It is a very, very valuable document that I really cannot stress enough that it's very valuable for you to read it. Um, I also think downloading Combit and actually being able to work through the tutorials is going to kickstart your ability to use this so much. It really is. Um, and then I think probably the last really important thing about it is just honestly just having some examples to use. Um, having some examples to reverse engineer. And Cabinet Vision has done some really, really good reports. The ask string function I know you can add different answers into the box to select different answers. Do you know if there's a way to add a variable that pops up for any one-off scenarios? Well, it's kind of that's that's kind of like the um, that's kind of like the ProLAM report um, where we've got the drop-down and there's the matching backer and the white and the black or the raw, but you can also type in that field. Does that about is that about kind of cover that or were you thinking something slightly different so i think i think what simply toast is saying here is let me close this without saving um where are you prolam report Many reports. I cannot believe I'm not saying this right now. There we go. All right, so Simply Toast was asking more or less how did we do this? Um, how did we set this up so that? Not only is there a drop down because of ask choice, but how do you also set this up so that you can type your own value in? So this was a new line definition um, and it's a form control. When you insert a form control, you start to get some additional controls over here. And ultimately what we're looking at is a combo box. So a combo box is a drop down 
that allows you, if, if I'm not mistaken, it is a drop down that allows you to edit it. But um, I think you actually have to check editable up here to yes for that combo box to be something that you can actually type into as well as having your own choices. And so there's value in this for sure, but if you want to lock something down, do not make it editable. Um, otherwise you can definitely run into problems. So that was a good question. Thank you, Toast. Um, so one, one other thing that somebody asked about, and I don't have like a spectacular example of it on my own, because I don't really run reports that total dollar amounts because of the way we operate. However, somebody was asking about how do you get numbers to kind of total at the bottom of a report? And so I asked them to send me some examples of their reports to see like what they're talking about. And um, unfortunately, the reports they sent me seem to all be working, but Creating totals has to do with how you set up your your values in general. But essentially, you're just looking for the right kind of formula. And I think that you need to have it in a specific area, specifically a footer, right? But um, summing the values of all of these things because of the way the report editor works, it's really just as simple as this, so far as I understand. Again, it's just going to repeat all the rows. It's going to take all of those values. And then because this is a footer line, it's going to take the information from every single row that was reported. And it's going to combine it into one value because we've said sum. So essentially, that, that's what it is. It, it needs to be in the footer line. And then you need to reference the right fields. So that's kind of vague, I guess. And these are going to be collection variables, which I already said at the outset that I, I, I have a hard time kind of explaining. But essentially, um, oy. so this is saying if the materialist's unit of issue ID is 11, then we want to count these units as each, but not each individual piece, as would be the case down here, pairs. So unit of issue ID equaling 11 is surely going to be like drawer guides, um, something that you've selected as a pair. And so this, this collection variable thing here is, I mean, it's doing exactly what it's called, right? It's collecting information. Um, and so as it goes, it's going to collect all of those values as the report runs, and then it's just going to add it together based on the formula that you create here. So I'll try to do a little more, um, something a little more in depth on this, maybe next week um, or the week after. But in a nutshell, if you want something to total, you should really be using a footer line um, rather if you want a subtotal, you should use a group footer. If you want a grand total, you should use a footer. Um, and you know what? There is one other thing that I kind of wanted to at least touch on, and that was something that I was asked to do by somebody. I don't recall what it was, but they were. Your general summary had a working total, but wasn't set up in the boss like that. Her list didn't have a working total. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I messaged on the forums. Um, let's just communicate about it a little bit more because I, I think that it's possible I'm using a different version of the software than you, and that might be why, like what I was seeing, didn't make sense to me, but. Let's talk a little. Let's talk a little bit more about that afterwards. Um, so, somebody asked me to, how do we drive notes from Cabinet Vision to the S2M Center? Um, and this essentially is because 
the SWM Center and Cabin Division use two separate databases. Yeah, okay, so if you're on 2021, let me open it up in 2021 um, after the stream and take a look at it, and then we can probably work on getting you the solution that you're after. I thought that that was the case because my format was very different from yours as well, so. So um, we still scan barcodes. I don't. I don't know. I don't have a huge issue with it, but I I, I wish we would um, do it a little bit differently. But anyway, um, I've modified this one so that on every single cut sheet, every single nested printout, um, if there's a problem part. Our shop operators, or our equipment operators and shop managers know exactly who to take it to because this is a field that does need to be filled out by them. Um, just something I figured I would show. But, all right. So, this is my attempt to drive notes from Cabinet Vision to parts. And I think the most challenging aspect of this is the fact that the notes table has about four total um, columns, if you will, fields. You've got note.note, .note, which is like the actual value. You've got the prompt for it, which is the description or the question or whatever. And then you have the parent type and the parent ID. And so what makes this so challenging is when you're working within cabinet vision, the parent ID is the ID of the part. But when you drive your stuff from Cabin Division into the S2M Center, the part IDs all change um, is about the best way that I could try to describe it. So this would be the default parts list as created by Cabin Division. And I've grouped it by cabinet. And this is just all these different lengths with the comment field, right? So here is my modified SQL and my table that I've built. And so it's the same list of parts, but a little bit different, obviously. Um, it is a work in progress. But what I have started trying to do with this, essentially, is um, two things. First of all, it's very valuable to add, let's see if I can find it in your registry and this is in the help file so don't try to make this change based on what i'm showing you if you're going to do this read the help file um, and go through it that way but let's see if i can find it here cnc populate report okay so if you create a new string cnc populate report and obviously, right, I've already got that, so I can't. And then you set the value of one. When you go from cabinet vision to the S2M center, your report.mdb, which is the database that carries all of your cabinet vision information, will essentially be imported into the S2M center. And at that point, it all becomes accessible. So that is the first, really, that is the most important thing because otherwise, you're you're trying to gather data that you don't have. So we'll try to show you that here. These are my imported parts. Um, and this is the part list. So this part list came already with this report from Cabinet Vision. The imported parts was an actual import that I did. So if I did not have CNC populate in my registry, second. <clears throat> if I had not made that registry entry, when I came to do this import, um, because notice the source is CV data, I'm not looking at report 
.accdb or mdb or whatever it is at this point, right? I'm looking at the CV data source. However, because of what I did, I now actually have access to some of my speaking out of turn. I think I am. Let me gather myself on this a little more before I talk about it more because I really don't want to give you guys bad information. But um, in a nutshell, setting your registry that way first to drive the data where you need it is very, very important. Um, from that point, what I've tried to do here is I've tried to do a left join. And I know I said we weren't going to talk about queries, but essentially I tried to do a left join and I pulled all of the parts that were generated by the um, by the very robust, complicated query that was built by somebody on the Cabin Division team. So I pulled everything from that table in here and then I joined only the parts that I imported to them on their cabinet ID. So what this means is um, my parts list has an assembly number on it, right? We've got one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. My, and, and this, again, this parts list comes from a lot of very complicated stuff and it's related to your run numbers on this particular one. Um, this is every single part that gets sent to the S2M center. So then I've taken my imported parts list, which is direct from Cabinet Vision, not from the S2M Center, right? This is from Cabinet Vision before we got to the S2M Center, but it also has a cabinet ID. And so what I've done here is I have joined the two tables based on the cabinet ID. And that's really probably the most important thing to start with because once you do that, it becomes a lot easier to associate the note that you're trying to tie to the part because now you have um, essentially you have your relationship between those two separate part tables and it gives you a better way to create the association but truth be told i'm still struggling through this i i spent a good amount of time on it um and when I was last looking at this, I had a lot fewer parts in here and it actually looked, it looked better. It looked more like I was getting to what I needed, right? But I'm still not there with it. I'm still not um, experienced enough with the query to build a, the right kind of query. And I also believe to actually make this work, I'm probably going to have to use some VB scripting to drive the data from cabinet vision and and maybe do some table joining outside of the software before i bring it back in but until i know more about vb script in general i won't be able to do that and i won't be able to talk about it so anyway um we're coming up on 11 a.m i'm not sure how many people are still here but uh i hope you guys have enjoyed the stream and it's something that Truth be told, the first week I was pretty nervous about, but I feel a good bit better this week, and I'm I'm actually really looking forward to the next the next ones, and I'm extraordinarily appreciative of the feedback you guys are giving, and honestly, I really really like giving back to the community. I've learned so much from everybody over the years. Uh, many many of you watching this, I've learned things from, and I'm very grateful for all of you. So thank you guys so much i really appreciate it and uh we'll see you guys next time